Finders Fair is excited to be hosting local artist Abigail McLaurin at our next class exhibit. That will be opening the first Thursday in December. That's December the 4th and will be on display until the first week in January. For those of you that don't know, CLASS stands for Contemporary Local Artist Show Series. Abigail is with us today and she's agreed to talk with us about her art. Welcome, Abby. Thank you for having me, Dexter. Where did it all start? About how old were you? Do you remember? No, I don't think I remember. I, I was just, it just happened to ha happen, you know, it just happened to be. Um, my, I come from a family of artists and so naturally you know, they teach you to it. So you were exposed to it all along. Yeah, I was exposed to it. My mom, she teaches, or actually she retired from uh, culinary arts, uh, home ec major, and my dad teaches art. Mm -hmm. Right now he's currently teaching engineering, so it was sort of happened to be the great environment yeah. to grow up in. Was there something in particular that encouraged you to pursue it? Um, when growing up, I actually struggled with a speech impediment, and so I was it was easier for me to express myself through oh. art versus yeah. words. You can start to you can yeah. see that I stumble yeah. over my words pretty bad right now. Well, <laughs> but that's good. It's, uh, it is what it is. Well, so it had it kind of always been a given that you would pursue it when you went to school? Yeah. Um, it's the one thing I knew that I wanted to do. I've always wanted to do it. I think art in itself is not necessarily a choice. It's sort of like an addiction. It's like you have to draw. It's this feeling inside you, and you have no control over pursuing it. It sort of chooses you in that manner. Uh -huh. Good. So, where did you go to school? I went to school at uh, Coker College in Hartsville, South Carolina. That's where I got my degree. It's a small private school, and I had trouble deciding, actually. Uh, I had my heart set on Greensboro. Uh, North Carolina up there forever because my parents went there and then I just happened across uh, this school and saw their art building. It smelled dirty, there's people working in the summer and Jim Bowden out there smoking cigarettes and Gene Grosser, I mean the professors were still there and stuff and it felt like the right fit and it was. So, so when did you graduate? I graduated in 2009, yes. Sorry, I had to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what? how did you wind up here in Bowman? Uh Unfortunate circumstances, <laughs> ex-boyfriends. So oh, okay. It tends to happen. Yeah. So you, you came from there to here. And tell us a little bit about how you choose your subjects. Oh, you know, I started uh, exploring family. Uh, actually, in college, one of my first drawing projects was uh, doing a narrative and I was just drawn toward doing these triptychs in school and I started collecting my family images in school because it was like free to print stuff out and I figured out how to hack the system and print all my images I needed and I still have like a fuku of images and so I kept playing with that and after school I struggled a little bit you know you always struggle with that transition uh, with, you know right after school and trying to discover who you are as a person, as an artist, separate from an institution. And so I went through several phases of drawing uh, congenital deformities, and um, it was always figurative. Congenital deformities and uh, baby dolls, and landed back on where I started when I was in school, at these images. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, for me, I always look for an awkwardness that is within the image. Oh, that's interesting. Something that makes makes the image different or different. I for most people, people look at their family photographs and they see a happy scene. For me, I see. Uh, I guess I'm more in tune to the awkwardness. Maybe I apply more of myself onto it when I'm searching for a particular. Like photo. reading between the lines. Reading I mean, between. Most the photographs lines. are posed. So everybody's yeah. on their best behavior. So I'm always looking at particular images that I can collage together to maybe enhance that awkwardness or enhance that disconnection. Um, a lot of my stuff is family narratives, but really it's, um, it's trying to understand our family currently now through looking at the past. I mean, that's a, sort of a strange juxtaposition there is to choose 1940s and, or the golden era images mm -hmm. and uh, trying to search with applying current contemporary themes onto it. Yeah. 
Well, let's talk about this painting that you brought with you today. Sure. Um, I mean, when I look at it, I see this this mother figure with a, a turban on her head, and she's got a baby beside her, mm -hmm. but there's also another child here. It's almost a ghost image. Mm -hmm. What what tell us what this means? Well, this work was uh, one of the reasons that I was attracted to the image was this, the, this awkward of looking at this child and you know this is actually 1960s and that's actually a big giant hair fun but I like the idea uh -huh. of the turban that's uh, just has to do with where we're at currently and how we you know culturally and mm -hmm. stuff right. to put a turban on our head but that would actually still be 60s with a turban um, I think it's the idea of a forced situation for me when I look at this. A lot of people see a happy scene of a mother staring at her newborn, but this is her father, and that's actually her mother holding the child. And though it's you're not sure what's really going on, I think um, it's an introduction to not only consequences, but also rewards that are unseen. Does that make sense? I know that's... No, I, it does. I it hate does. I hate talking about the work because really it's ultimately determined by the viewer. The viewer, right. You know, I enjoy the process. This actually has three or four drawings underneath it which are coming through. Well, you know, I this, noticed when I skylighted it, I could see some textures that didn't seem to have any meaning with, with what I'm seeing straight on, and yeah. I wondered about that. Yeah, a lot of this has, uh, I think this has four, five, six, six drawings. This is a final. We'll probably go. I'll probably continue drawing over top of it. I think that's the thing with me and my work. It's always in a state of becoming. Um, it's it's never stationary too long. And I'll probably draw over this when I've become dissatisfied with it, which is, you know, it's just like uh, I mean, it's just like a bread. It has a shelf life. All art has a shelf life for me. Um, I rather stare at someone else's pieces than my own. Oh, I can see that. You, you know, it, it's like somebody that cooks. They they love to cook, but they're not interested in eating their own. Food, <laughs> own yes, food. definitely. Uh, That's interesting. But the work is uh, this is uh, actually was part of a series called Golden Drops of Grain, which is actually dealing with hitting puberty and coming of age. And this is coming of age for women, and it's uh, the course that we all have to take. And we live in a very uh, we, you know, we live in the southern Bible belt, if you can say that, uh, where women at a young age decide they have bare children and that's sort of the pinnacle of their career and life. Though that's changing, um, it's still a very predominant uh, fashion, if I can put it that way, or fad that people get married young and they have children young here. So that's part of your inspiration, is looking into that and trying to... Yeah, the cultural... Um, yeah cultural norms here and how that influences our role, or my role, and uh, women's role within society. Um, so that's, that's usually what my work has to, to you okay. know, do. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Abby, this piece that you brought today, um, this is a piece that you're currently working on. It's not completed. Yes, it's uh, one that's in progress. Well. What look? I see a lot of different kinds of medium. What do you normally work in? Whatever's laying around in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I find trash on the floor. Like this is like a trash bag, and I was really excited about the texture because I glued it, and then I took my torch to it. I have a torch that lays around, so mm -hmm. sometimes you'll smell burning plastic or wood and stuff like that around my studio. Well, is there is there something that that? Uh, but I mean, it's adhered to the to the to the back with, with just paint or? Uh, sometimes it's done with uh, gesso and uh, wood glue is what I like to use. Okay. And sometimes if it's like a heavy object, liquid nails, you can never go wrong with liquid nails. Well, so you have, when you're doing them, you use a combination of mediums. Oh, yeah. Do you, and because of your training, I'm assuming, but I'm asking you because I want to know, do, the, do you have an eye or, or a thought towards longevity and the, the life so, well, of the well, yeah, to a certain extent I do, um, but there's a point where, you know, that can box you in from exploring what the possibilities are. You know, I, I saw Rauschenberg where he used tooth, I think, I think it was like, what was it, it was 
toothpaste and nail polish yes. and they cannot figure out how that color has withstained the, the longevity of it because it should have decayed like 10 years after it was probably made. Um, there's, you know, I, and you look at his work um, or you look at other people's work. You know, it's, in the end, I think the work, if you take care of it, it'll last. Well, that's the, the legacy of the piece, um, and I don't know how you feel about it at your stage in your art, but I look at things, especially being in, in, in this business, a lot of times from the perspective of how long things have lasted and how well they've been taken care of, and, and that they have, you know, like look at the Rembrandts we have, oh, yeah. because he was in control of his medium, mm -hmm. and he knew what to use and what not to use because he, he was educated in those things, and like you are. And that's why I was wondering if, if that idea of a legacy was important to you. No, it's not. I, I guess this is where I sort of differ from the idea of the self. Um, I don't even like writing my name on it. I know? noticed that most of your pieces are not signed. No, I don't like signing my names. It's even hard for me to come up here and sort of talk about myself and the work, because in the end, I think the work is up to the viewer and it's left well, up to the viewer. It becomes uh, a separate process. A famous artist, uh, Marcel Duchamp, said that art only exists once an artist is finished with the work, the artist kind of steps back and the art exists between the viewer and the piece. Mm -hmm. and the artist is no longer part of the art. Yeah. So I understand that and I think that's very intriguing. Um, but up until that point, it's so interesting for somebody that's a collector and, and enjoys art to understand the processes and, and, you know, that it's not just some happenstance thing. There's a yeah. lot of thought that went into this and a lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of creative things. And I, you know, oh, I think yeah. that's why I wanted you to talk about it because well, we can sense that. You know, I'm, I am, I have evolved in the way I choose to use my application of materials archival. You know, if you're talking about the archival ability of it, but there is a certain point where, you know, in the end, I'm not gonna, I don't mind if the work dies just like me and you, you know? Who's to say that there's not a war and it doesn't get destroyed? You know, we look at Caravaggio, there's only like 70 known works, but he supposedly created a painting a day. He was a master. But think about how many works have been destroyed that we don't even know the names of these artists. In the end, I think the work should reflect something about our own sense of humanity, our own sense of who we are. And that's why my surfaces are, in a sense, mistreated and um, raw and sort of, there's a destructive aspect to the way I even produce my work. You know, you, this is actually part of another piece, or was, until I took it away and changed that composition and started, you know, I had to tear it up. I have to tear up my pieces in order to, to find what it is that I want to say with her, or what the image is saying. Um, you know, what I've discovered is that there is a marriage between the, uh, the picture plane and the image. I know that's a really abstract thing, but the picture plane wants to be something. It's just like Michelangelo carving a stone. You, you cannot force it. You have to allow it to speak for you. And when I start collaging on it and allowing it to evolve, I start to see an image on it. And I allow that image to develop. And it'll probably change So it again. kind of evolves when you're working on it. It does. It does evolve. If you saw what I was what I was referencing, you'd probably be like, I don't see that at all. <laughs> <laughs> just, and uh, that's just, you know, I see the world much differently than other well, people. Well, I'm Abby. Talking to you, listening to you explain this, and hearing what you just said has educated me. Oh, yeah. I understand it on a deeper level, which mm -hmm. is, I think, one of the wonderful things about art. It makes you think in different planes, oh, different yeah. uh, perspectives, and and that's wonderful. So that's a good thing for you to be here and talk to us about <laughs> this. <laughs> it's, an, it's a little nerve-wracking because it is, you know, art, uh, the pr production process of it and producing uh, it's such a personal process, you know. Well, um, I can understand that. But I think you've, you've, you've really shared some interesting things about your work. So, Abby, in closing, what advice would you give to an aspiring artist that wasn't sure whether or not they really were able or capable or 
good enough to pursue law, what would you tell them? Um, to be fearless. Fearless. Mm -hmm. I like that. Fearless. Yeah, you have to be when pursuing it. You know, you have to take chances with your work. And if you doubt yourself, then you'll make a mistake. And I guess really there are no mistakes in art. No, there are not. So thank you all for watching today, and we hope you'll all come to first Thursday, December 4th, here at Finder's Fair to meet Abby, to see her newest works, talk with her, and visit with her. Thank you very much, Abby, for being here. Well, thank you for coming out. I hope I look forward to seeing you guys. And one more thing, Abby, fearless, I think you ought to sign your works. <laughs> I probably should.